Hey guys, Ed here. Do you enjoy robots, blazing fast, rigid tapping, tool changes, and rapid speeds? Nearly three foot tall, 40,000 page stacks of manuals? Well, have we got the machine for you? Because today we're gonna be going over our experience owning a RoboDrill with an LRMate 200 robot arm production cell. This machine is a 2015 Fanuc RoboDrill Alpha D14 MIA5. That 14 is for the 14 position tool changer. The M means medium bed. It has a drill in its name, but don't let that fool you. This is a full featured machining center capable of roughing steel and fine high detail surface contouring. This has the 10,000 RPM high torque spindle with 5.4 continuous horsepower and 18.7 peak horsepower for periods of up to one minute. Rapids are 2,125 inches a minute in all three axes and 1,181 inches a minute all three axes for contouring. And the control is the 31i B5 fanic control. As ubiquitous as the fanic control is, we were really surprised to see very little info out there just in terms of beginner user walkthroughs, things like that. For people who have similar machines, we've been working up and proving out tons of recipes through production that we will soon be documenting and putting up as recipes on Proven Cut. This machine came from a local trade school who bought it for their robotics program and found out that it's probably a little bit too much machine for beginners just starting out running a machine with rapid speeds of 2,125 inches a minute on all three axes. Things can go wrong very, very fast. You guys may remember that a few years back, we posted a few videos of John helping them get this machine going with more memory and better toolpaths from Fusion. Card here if you'd like to go back and give those a rewatch. With some assistance from the riggers, we handled all of the disassembly, loading, unloading, installation, electrical, all of that, commissioned the machine completely ourselves and had no problems. I think the hardest part of the actual machine installation was figuring out exactly where we should mount the robot on the ground. There were drawings of this included with the machine, but it didn't seem right when we set everything up. Went back to the school and verified that it was correct. Just some clearances looked a little odd as well, but worked out fine. We were extremely excited to finally get a real robot arm in our shop. Automation, unattended lights out machining with this thing. The Fanuc robot control programming at the pendant, not the most user-friendly thing in the world. Seems to be par for the course for Fanuc. So we teamed up with Ready Robotics, a fairly local company, who provide a very easy to use touchscreen interface retrofit controls that sit on top of the original robot control. With that, we were easily able to sort of visually program through all of the waypoints and steps and get the robot loading, flipping parts for OP2 and unloading finished parts into the part drawer. All that being said, we have ended up not using the robot because this educational cell system only allows the robot to reach maybe six inches into the work area, which is not an ideal situation at the moment for the kind of parts we're running. So production has mostly been ran on this machine with Pearson pallets. This helps a lot with the machine not having a spindle probe. You only have to pick up that zero point on the Pearson base one time. Everything from the base up to the pallet and the parts can all be programmed in fusion to a common coordinate system. Along with not having a spindle probe, there is no tool touch off probe on this machine. So to measure gauge length, we figured the length of our Hymer as our zero reference using our Spironi optical tool setter and then the Z offset of all tools are also measured and manually entered on the Spironi, which has proven to be a completely manageable workflow for this machine. We're not changing tools out very often. If we do, we'll write down the offset on a tag so it doesn't need to be remeasured. It's pretty quick and easy. So no complaints in that area, really. I don't miss probing as much as I expected to. For higher volume runs, not having probing can save time because you're forced to set up you know, a zero point style or get your, get your parts styled in right for the first time and then Everything after that will run without having to say, throw a part in a vise and probe X for small differences every run. Another great feature of this machine is full chip wash down for the base and walls of the enclosure. Requires a huge coolant tank to do this, multiple coolant motors, but this thing stays spotless, especially when compared to some of our machines that have chip augers or chip conveyors. We did add a one-way check valve to the tool coolant line. It was taking a few seconds for the coolant to pump all the way up the column and back down the spindle, by which time this machine's rapids had it already deep in the cut and gumming up tools with aluminum. Now, I know in the beginning I said this is a full-featured milling machine, which is true, but especially ours being the high-powered version, its comfort zone is drilling and tapping massive holes. So here it is plowing through some aluminum with a three-quarter tin cut tap. Absolutely no struggle at all. It's programmed at the machine's max tapping RPM of 5,000, but uh, looks like it only hits around 3K. But still, look at that. I mean, look at it, would you? Would you look at it? 
Wrapping up with some production footage of our ModVice soft jaws on a Pearson pallet fixture, just to let you get a better feel for those tool change speeds and rapids. As a hardcore machinery nerd, this tool changer mechanism and how all of this works with the spindle has to be one of my favorite things about this machine and probably my favorite thing I've ever seen on a CNC machine. The tool turret is spring-loaded rearward and rides on a cam on the Z-axis so that when Z is fully retracted, the tool tips under the spindle nose and a gear on the spindle nose meshes with the tool turret using the spindle's rotation to change to the next tool position on the turret. So if you've ever wondered what that gear on the nose of a robo drills are, it is what rotates the tool turret. Also, the drawbar is actuated by an internal cam and lever when the Z is fully retracted. So there are no dedicated electrical or pneumatic actuators in the entire tool change system. It is all actuated by the machine's Z movement and a turn of the spindle to change tool positions. It's just crazy mechanical efficiency. And it's part of what makes these high speed tool changes super reliable, being mechanically linked to the machine's motion like this. The two biggest weak points for me are quite low drawbar force. Uh, this is a dual contact spindle, which means that the taper of the tool holder and the spindle bore slightly elastically deform under drawbar pressure to allow for full face contact with the nose, that secondary dual contact surface. With no drawbar tension, there is a small gap between the spindle nose and the secondary contact surface of the tool holder. The problem this has is that drawbar force is really low, around only 500 pounds from the factory, which in our case caused this fretting corrosion on the tool holders and in the spindle bore. Over time, this will ruin your spindle bore and that will transfer to ruining tool holders. This low drawbar pressure may be a consequence of the mechanically actuated drawbar that I mentioned earlier. Typically on a 30 taper dual contact machine, we're seeing readings north of 900 up to around 1200 pounds. So if you're looking at one of these machines for heavy roughing and steels, for example, it's not a deal breaker, but something you would need to be aware of. Dual contact BBT spindle may not be the best choice on one of these machines. And the other thing is the control. The control's all right, it's super stable. It's not unusable, just not user friendly. <laughs> Lots of extraneous button pushes required for simple tasks and weird little navigational quirks are the primary gripes. Just things in there that you think would have been patched or figured out by this point in this controls developmental history. So here's a few examples of those. We don't have networking on this machine, so loading a file from a DNC memory card is the best workflow we have at the moment. Once loaded, as long as the file name doesn't change, different programs on the card will run from the remote file menu automatically. Initially, we were using a USB, which acquired this insane list of button presses every single time you want to load a file. We are still learning and there may be better ways of doing some of these things, so if you have any suggestions, please let us know in the comments. The washdown coolant control is buried in a soft menu in the Quicken C section and is called flood coolant, so that took some hunting to find. As ubiquitous as the FANUC control is, I had a hard time finding just a basic walkthrough of the control. The wait for that is almost over because we will be putting up a video on the NYC CNC site going going over all of the operational basics and tips and tricks that we would have wanted to know as beginners with this control. My buddy Joe, Almighty Hose on Instagram, came out and spent the day with me, walked me through the basics of the control, and then a few other questions were answered by Ben Benz, Freelux on Instagram. So huge shout out to those two guys and a few other folks who gave us some little tips along the way. All right, that's all for now. Hopefully those of you like us who weren't super familiar with these machines before have a better feel for what they can do. Thanks for watching, hope you learned something. We'll see you next time.